At the A4ID Responsible Business event on Tuesday the 17th of July 2012, Tamsin Ratcliffe, CEO of impact investment firm Nexi, spoke on Nexi's Impact Exchange, a stock exchange for social enterprise and the impact investment model in the context of the developing world. Let me just say that, that one of my briefs was to try and be controversial. And coming from the South, um, I thought that, that that's fine. I did just take counsel. So here's my disclaimer, <laughs> OK? Um, but really just to say what I'm, what I'm really addressing is some of this issue around, because I think we're talking about development, we're talking about aid, we're talking about impact investors. And um, coming from the world that is looking for money, some of the, the questions that are starting to come to the fore are, is there actually a D and DFI? It, where is the development focus as opposed to the financial institution focus? Is there an I, an impact investor? Or is it a very small I or very big I for investor? And so these are some of the questions that I think impact investing is getting to um, now that we are. So that being said, um, I think really one of the things that we're looking at in development, in aid, in impact investing is the whole poverty cycle, is the fact that actually when you're living in poverty you do not have necessarily the ability to be generative you may have the capacity but you may but you don't have the ability you don't have that ability to engage with the productive means being a capital being an energy being whatever it is and so you get into the cycle um, of poverty um, nobody wants to put their money there because actually there aren't enough returns um, most particularly in our immediate short-term quick fix culture and so this actually gets worse and worse. And so within this, in terms of, of a lack of investment, is this whole idea that poverty becomes its own anchor. It, it, it's, it becomes impossible to actually move. And within that context, I think the issue is, what is the role of aid? And, and um, you know, I think um, Vinay was talking about this failure of public good, that you get all these taxes, you get all these kind of drawbacks, and you know, eventually take blood from a stone. Um, and where does the aid go? We all hear about how much aid is being sent, and in fact, who was I talking to this morning? Who was American? Oh, it was, sorry, it, it was one of the people at White and Case who made this point of often USAID, you know, as much is coming in, it's being taken out of the back pocket. So where does aid go? And, you know, there have been dimensions looking at how much of USAID, and please let me say USAID is one of our investors, and they have been quite tremendous. Um, but as aid goes, all, the, all countries, not only USAID, look at where does that money get spent. I mean, I remember working with even British aid in South Africa. If you were getting cement to build a water tank, you had to not use any other country's cement with your cement so that they could identify that's the British aid cement, you know. So, I mean, to some extent, the, the aid in practice on the ground is actually where do you feel it? Um, and I think that really, if we look at what the role of aid was um, or is, supposedly, it is really to lay the foundations for private sector investment. The idea of development aid was to go into places where private sector investment wasn't yet happening, it was too risky, it was a little bit too nervous, and it was really to try and look at how could this start building um, countries to have the capacity to use aid and to use it well. And, um, how they enhance productivity. So ultimately, the original role of aid was actually to be the D in a, in a DFI, um, and to be, if you like, the precursor for ultimately what impact investing or private sector investment, whether it's private equity or impact investment. Um, and I think that has had varying levels of success. The question is, where do we see that success? How does it get into those? communities at a fundamental level and who is affected okay we have a world i mean south africa is a case in point ashamedly um, has now become the worst discrepancy in um in in gini coefficient in the world um, and this is the situation that you have you have people believing that they are completely unaffected by it because they are so rich and you have the others who um but the reality, and I think this is what 2008 ha is starting to do, is actually we're all in the same boat. And in fact, in some ways, um, the poor are in, are to, to the extent 
that they've worked from a lower base are potentially higher up in the in the boat. You know, I mean, this has just said it very well for me. Um, so really, the the understanding in the markets has been about what is the cost of financial return. What, what is the trade-off actually that has been happening? Um, interestingly enough, in impact investing, the big question is, well, how much financial return am I trading for social impact? And my response is, you know, how much? Who invests in BP? I don't want to even know, but you know, what is the trade-off for the the profit you got from a BP investment last year? Nobody thinks about the social impact trade-off or the or the environmental trade-off, and I think that's really what impact investing is starting to push. How do we get towards a middle? How do we get a more inclusive idea of risk and a more inclusive idea of return? So this is, I think, really been the benefit of the global financial crisis, is, is really this understanding of, hold on a second, yes, we're all in the same boat in, in varying measures. We have to start getting more realistic about this. And so you see the evolution of impact investing, the evolution of responsible capital, et cetera, you know, this kind of progression of actually we have to have a broader benefit. There is no way we are, we are disconnected from each other. Um, so what do we mean by impact investing, otherwise called sustainable finance, socially responsible investing, etc.? I think if I would just distinguish, for me, impact investing, and it's a word that's not here, but it's the provision of financial capital and risk um, products to proactive or intentional businesses or initiatives that promote or address a specific social environmental need. So um, we are not necessarily looking at do no harm investments, which are designed to generate a profit as their primary purpose. We are looking at really a proactive, intentional um, delivery of impact investments. And I think that to some extent this may be, ideally would be, a short-term requirement if we do move to a more balanced world. Um, you know, so um, whilst a lot of people say, well, impact investing is so hype, and actually all SMEs in developing contexts are impact investments because they do job creation, not entirely true. Um, the purpose of that business and the purpose of that investment is really what cat categorizes something as an impact investment. Um, so for us, the question has been, how do you create a new market for these products? And um, how do you really look at how that financial market, you know, Vinny was talking about how financial markets are failing. Part of that is because there's the short-termism, part of that is because there are quick trades that, that go in and out and so on. How do we address that in a, in a market sense? The trade-off for impact, interestingly enough, many people will tell you, especially some of the early impact investors, I think Vinny would even say, he hasn't necessarily traded financial return for impact, certainly not when you're exiting. It may just take a longer period of time. Um, so this has been part of the experience. And unfortunately, to some extent, microfinance being a, the, the best case in point, when microfinance started over 30 years ago, it was what impact investing is today. It was a very long term, a very patient capital, and nobody made money out of the initial microfinance. It was exactly what Vinny said, which is patient capital over a long period of time. Suddenly, though, everybody started making a fortune, and microfinance became this amazing thing. What, you know, look at me, I got so rich helping the poor. The reality is that. What started happening is people went into tip of the icebergs, went into what's called you know, tier one. Everybody would suddenly say, there's no, more micro, there's no more tier one microfinance investments. Nobody went into microfinance for tier one. Acumen, I wouldn't believe, and I'm not speaking for you, but wouldn't be a tier one seeker. They are looking for things that are potential tier one investment opportunities or businesses later. And I think that this is really what has started happening, unfortunately, in the microfinance world and what we need to guard against on the impact investment side. And in fact, this impact imposters was a term that was used last week by the gin, was just saying, beware the impact imposters and you know, how do we define impact? And I don't think that's with a view to being precious about what impact is, but I think it's with a view to being honest about what is our intention in investing and how do we actually broaden that investment focus and not make it think that this is a quick way to make a good buck and have a feel-good effect um, with that. 
So really, if I just give you a little bit about Nexi and, and where we've come from, um, we've spent, as Claire mentioned, um, this is our, our, fundamentally our purpose. Our purpose is to really provide access to investment opportunities that have an intentional um, purpose of creating positive social environmental value. We started actually post-1994 um, democracy in South Africa, initially looking at how could we invest in a new um, social justice program of development. Um, we started engaging with pension funds. We started seeing that actually there was a huge ability of these social purpose um, organizations to start accessing debt, even equity, um, although initially, historically, it's been debt because most of these were set up as charities, um, fundamentally at the beginning, um, and really started seeing that, that there was a new way of finding capital that was beyond philanthropy, but there was a new way of investing that was beyond SRI. And I think, it's, for me, it's quite an important thing to say that impact investing is not a transformation of philanthropy, and I would really guard against anybody who has the idea that this is a new form of philanthropy. If it's going to cannibalize anybody's pocket, it should be traditional mainstream finance investment, not philanthropy. Philanthropy is as important today as it has ever been, in fact, if not more so in terms of some of the origination. But I think what we are speaking to under impact investing, and, and certainly that tip of the iceberg, is trying to speak to the, what Vinnie had as the pioneer gap. So really that is our purpose. And um, how do we create a more inclusive way of determining return, a more inclusive way of determining risk profiles um, to the extent that there is the integrated investment reporting standards that are looking at traditional or financial markets reporting on three dimensions. That is great news for impact investing. Um, to the extent that investors will start being penalized legally that there is a cost to BP's shareholders for what, what happens as a result of their practices, we are going to see much more serious note taken of how people are measuring impact on all dimensions, not only social um, profit organizations. So really, our, our work is fundamentally and, and particularly around, um, and I don't know that we've actually said it, but Nexi has established the first social stock exchange in the world now. It's the IX. Um, and Tim, I think, will be speaking to some of that um, after this. But really, the idea behind the IX is there is no venue for exclusive trading or awareness or listing of these high-impact businesses. And that's what the IX does. But more importantly than that, a stock exchange thickens the service provision around it. So because you have a stock exchange, you need legal advisors, you need financial intermediaries, you need impact intermediaries, you need all of those um, service providers who start formalizing this industry, who start developing measurement standards. And that, that is, I think, really what is key around, uh, around what, we, what we've been working on and trying to do. Equally, we have established, and, and this is bearing in mind, this is a, a, a sector that, as Benny said, you've got your early stage, you're, you're needing to scale, and your exit opportunities. So what we did was we established two platforms. The IX is a public exchange. Um, it's a board of the Stock Exchange of Mauritius, who was our first partner as an African regional partner. But it is a global platform that the Stock Exchange of Mauritius can list in three currencies, in all three currencies. But it is a public market, so it is subject to the regulatory issues that a public market has. To the extent that the sector is still young, we have a public, uh, we have a private market, and the idea behind the private platform was investors, to some extent, are looking for some liquidity, and they're also looking for some regulatory framework. So our private platform is in partnership with Euroclear, who are, as you know, a post-trade um, reporting, clearing, and settlement agency that can give a, um, a registered security to these businesses, can have global trading functionality can look at different currencies. And then we have, um, for either of the listed companies, we have what is a technical assistance grant-based platform. And the idea behind that is um, you can list on our platforms with a number of waivers. If you list on a waiver, you have to have a technical assistance program to address those waivers. And that gives you the ability to also use technical assistance grant finance. Um, in terms of building the capacity. So it's recognizing that this is a developing field, that there's a way that one can use the markets and development in a sort of a blended approach. Um, 
And why? Well, I think that really we've looked at the fact that markets have got far too short-termist. There is a significant and growing number of people who are wanting to invest at a retail level. Until we actually have stock exchange infrastructure or regulated infrastructure, brokers, advisors are still shying away from this. And so that is really one of the things we want to see is if we can actually make this available at the retail level, which is what the SEM, which is what the Euroclear platform can do, we're going to significantly change the behavior of the markets. Occupy Wall Street, you know, I always thought it's so funny that they blamed the Wall Street guys when actually it's their pension fund. So who is determining who acts with your mandate? And so to the extent that all of us have the ability, there's a great organization here in London called Fair Pensions. And really what Fair Pensions does is allow you as a pension fund member to interrogate where your pension fund is invested. Those kinds of organizations, as advocacy organizations, can change the face of how impact investing does with things like Acumen Fund, with things like the IX. Um, and so, you know, what if, well, what if it's a whole hoax? We've got a better world. I mean, it's, uh, it's a win-win, actually. So, thank you. That's uh, thank you. Thank you.